Well, hello, Endow ladies. It is my pleasure today to be with Mike Aquilina, who if you haven't read or, or heard, of, heard of him, you, you should. Um, I have been so formed and enriched by Mike's books and articles from a very young age as a, as a young adult from yesteryear, unfortunately. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I first encountered a great article that Mike wrote called Salt of the Empire, and it really framed evangelization in the early church with me. It, it lit a fire in me. I wanted to be a part of it. And so it was very, very crucial. And then later, years later, before I even studied theology or had any, any kind of, uh, didn't even know that was going to be the, my path at all. Later on, when I became a high school teacher, I had my students read that article, uh, which they loved. And, and I remember that, you know, getting high school students to, to read their homework is difficult, but they loved my, they loved your article. And, and eventually we started reading your book, Yours is the Church. So you've got, you're an award-winning author. You have like 50 books. I don't know how anybody does that, but you know, <laughs> amazing. Uh, and, and all sorts of amazing uh, Catholic interviews and television and projects that you've done. But that was another book that, again, we, we tend to dumb down education, but I, I, I had them read you, I had them read Joseph Rastinger, and they, they loved it, and they couldn't believe what they were learning, and so I love that, you know, yours is the church, it's a small little book, but it's, it's such a great little read, so I, I could, I, you know, there's 50 books to choose from, but that's the one I chose, because that's the one that I, that I had my high school students read, but I'm here today, this is a very, I just want all the ladies to know, this is a very frustrating interview, because there's a, there's all this, this, breadth of knowledge that Mike could share with us and how does one choose and you know I'm a sanguine personality I, I want all of it but I can't I have to choose one I have to focus today so let's focus on the early church and the role that women played how about that Mike <laughs> that so. sounds good I don't <laughs> think my ego will ever shrink again after that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. that is hilarious well you should yeah, enjoy it for a moment and then you know <laughs> We'll see, we'll see what the Lord does and brings us back down. But you, you really deserve it. And you've been such a huge help to my life and to my students, my former students. And, and I hope for the, the ladies listening who already know you, I'm, I know they're going to enjoy it. And for those that don't know you, they'll have all sorts of uh, frustrating decisions about which of your, your books to, to, to begin with first. Um, this was a hard, this was a hard one. Um, so uh, the early church. I, I get. To, I'm so proud of women in the early church. I'm so proud of us. And I also tend to think. And this is an early, early church. But Saint Jerome, later early church. You know, the women that were really crucial. I want. I want to talk about that one day. About without. You know, without the women, you don't get the Vulgate. You don't get Jerome's Vulgate. So, uh, but that's for another conversation. How about um, just the, the role of women? If you could just start us off with the, the crucial role of women in the early church. Well, I think you have to begin by considering the role of women in the Greco-Roman world, okay? Because women really had no, no rights to speak of. They were treated as uh, perpetual adolescents. They couldn't give testimony in a court of law. Um, they weren't considered reliable. Uh, they were the butts of jokes, you know, and, um, and, and a daughter was the worst thing that could happen to you, right? Because your daughter was going to be a drain on the family economy, was going to cost a dowry when you finally got around to marrying her off, and she was never going to bring money into your life. She wasn't going to be the one who gave you security in your own age. So the playwrights in pagan Rome, they referred to, to females as odious daughters. Whoa, you know? So this is, this is the world where Christianity arose. It was, a, it was, it was misogynistic, uh, you know, to use yeah. our contemporary term. Yeah. That's the world. Can I ask a, a, a very humble side tangent question? Did yeah. you know that, that children and sons and men come from women? So was there, any, was there any kind of acknowledgement that actually if you, if you get rid of all the girls or you put them down so much that you, you, don't, you don't get you, your existence is in question? Well, people tend not to think that far down the road, <laughs> right? Okay. But Caesar Augustus did, okay? okay. And in the first, we're talking about the, the, the turn of history here, okay? Because Augustus yeah. was the one who was emperor when our Lord was born, 
Okay, so he's from, he's the one who spans BC to AD. And Augustus really did a remarkable thing. He made a worldwide empire. And in doing that, he, he achieved world peace or something that looked like it for the first time. He yeah. achieved worldwide travel, uh, worldwide trade, and so many of, of those dollars, so to speak, were coming into Rome because Rome was the capital of the empire. So all the trade was benefiting the people of the city of Rome. It was, um, it was a remarkable thing. And Rome was enjoying such amazing affluence. You'd think that with all these good things happening, people would want to have children to share it with. People would want to look forward with hope because now the world is at peace. But they didn't. You know, it's a strange thing that happened. Um, uh, people got used to this unmoored, leisurely lifestyle that kind of floated from one party to another, one vacation to another. And, and children really cramp your style when that's what you want. And so people stopped having children. People stopped marrying. And this was something oh, that I was- I didn't know that. I, I wasn't aware of that. Interesting. Very so this, is, this was something that happened precipitously uh, during the lifetime of Augustus. And when he was 70 years old, he saw this was happening and he was farsighted enough to say, this is disastrous. Yeah. This is heading, you know, this has us headed for a demographic winter. Right. How are we going to continue the customs of the Roman civilization? How are we going to carry this forward with the Roman way of life when, when, when no one's reproducing, right. when we're killing the female children? Because, yeah. uh, I mean, infanticide was something that was very common. In a, in a city the size of Rome, it happened every day. Yeah, it wasn't just misogynism. It was, it was your, like, like Roman ditches being filled with baby girls. Right? That's right. I mean, that's right. Uh, you know, if you if this is something that we can't we can't imagine. Uh, but uh, but babies, there were no ultrasounds at the time. Right. So you didn't know the sex of a baby before birth. And what we have in the documentary record is uh, is is uh, abundant evidence that uh, female children were routinely killed at birth. Most of them were killed at birth. We have the census records for the city of Delphi, which is a pretty good sized city. Uh, many of the families that were registered in the census were fairly large families with many children. Mm -hmm. But out of 600 families, only six had more than one female offspring. Only six. Wow. So where did all those girls go? I'll tell you where they went. And you can see it in the archaeological record. In Ashkelon, a sewer was unearthed. And the sewer was unusable at, for its purpose because it was clogged with the bones of newborn babies. Okay, and most of them were female. Oh, wow. uh, similar baby dumps were unearthed in Athens, in an old well, and in uh, Scotland, uh, near, near a military encampment. So there were these, these mass graves of, of babies, most of them female. The others were, were babies who just were not wanted. So they were cast off. Maybe they were, they were handicapped in some way or blemished in some way. They freaked out their parents, or the parents just didn't feel they were ready for a child. They went down the sewer. This is what routinely happened. Wow. So this there is just part and parcel of the this is just part and parcel of the culture. Yes. yes. Yeah. And it was fed by the idea that women are not, they don't have equal dignity to men. So because of that, feel free to, to throw them out. Now, in the traditional Roman family, you needed women, right? Because right. you needed someone to carry on the right. family name, right? Yeah, so you needed women to bear your children. Uh, you needed someone to, to make your home and to, to do the rights for the lares and the penates, that sort of thing. That needed to be done. But once people got uh, into this lifestyle, this leisurely lifestyle, they didn't have time for all of that. They didn't really want that, at least not immediately. So they didn't do it. They didn't marry. And, and Augustus Caesar has this great address that he made to the males of the nobility, where he he divides them up. It's almost Solomonic the way he does it. He divides them up with the, uh, the married men on one side and the single men on the other side, the bachelors. And the, the crowd of bachelors is enormous. <laughs> He's like losers, get married. And, <laughs> and, and then like the, the, the guys who are married among the aristocrats, 
it's just tiny. So he does this, he does two speeches. One he addresses to the married aristocrats and he praises them. He says that they are, they are living like the gods in heaven. It's, it's a, a pagan theology of the body that he's putting out there. Well, I was just, that's so, that's so fantastic. And he's prophetic because you, as you said, he knew this is not good. He's right. built this successful, wealthy empire, but then the, the uh, rotten fruit of it, if you will, is, is this. I wonder if that reminds us of any other time. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> so, so he addresses them in this pagan theology of the body. It's a beautiful speech. You can look it up in, in Cassius Dio. Um, and then he turns to the others and he, and he says, you know, as they always do at the beginning of the speech, they address the people with O, oh, right? So he says, O. Oh. And then he says, I don't know what to call you. <laughs> I love the I drama. I call you men? So You're not acting like men. Should I call you citizens? You care nothing for your city. Should I call you Romans? And he goes on like this. Wow. Some point, and he insults them. He puts them down. It's an amazing speech. And then he followed up by, uh, by enacting laws forbidding these behaviors. Like it's amazing. Have you, have you told priests who are in search of homily material? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is the way we do it. We bring the dust off those old speeches by the emperor. That's incredible. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna look those up. This, this is Please do. fantastic. This is fantastic. Wow. So this is the place we find ourselves in a sense. This is what's going on. And do you, what, do we know what effect that ha did it? Do we have any records of reactions from? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, because an interesting thing happened. Um, uh, he, uh, Caesar Augustus enacted a series of laws that, um, that, that imposed tax penalties on, on spinsters and single, single men, bachelors. Um, and he gave tax breaks to those who were married. He's trying to get people to marry. He's trying to get them to have kids. And the more kids you, you had, the more government subsidy you could get. Wow. He, he tried to, to stack the deck, really, in yeah. favor of the family. Wow. And still people didn't take the bait. I mean, they, they looked at the fines and they said, eh, I can afford that. And they wow. just went on living the way they wow. did for 100 years and more, actually 200 years, the Roman emperors following his lead tried to legislate fertility My and they failed. And they failed. Because you can't legislate morality. It doesn't work. It doesn't right. work. Yeah. Not, not, on, not on a truly cultural effective level, right? Right. Not, not, right. not on that. Enter in our Lord. Jesus. <laughs> so then what happens? This is good. This is so gripping. I'm really getting into this. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that Christianity was the big game changer in history for women. It really was. You know, oh, yeah. St. Paul said this revolutionary thing that there, you know, in, in Christ, there's, there's, uh, there's neither slave nor free, you know, uh, woman nor man this is mind-blowing okay in antiquity there's it nothing is, it is mind it is mind-blowing and 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 you know uh, i you know i strive to be a charitable patient christian woman but i mean all of the debates about feminism today and toxic masculinity and all, and all this stuff this uh, this all presupposes a worldview and an, and ideas that were because of christianity you know. uh, let's look at, look, at, look at the first of his terms, okay? Yeah. In Christ, there's neither slave nor free, right? Yeah. At, 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 just, around that time, it's quite possible that as many as 50% of the, the, the men and women living in the Italian peninsula were slaves. Right. And those slaves had no rights. You could beat your slave, and it was legal. You could, you could sexually abuse your slave, male or female, and it, was and it was perfectly legal. You could do all those things. Your slave was property, and that was that. And Paul is saying, there's neither slave nor free. Oh, my gosh. The next time I read that, when I'm praying with the scriptures, it's going to hit me even harder, right? Because we can read that and go, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, because we take it for granted now as Christians. Sure. For, but to read that with that kind of historical perspective, that Paul is uttering these words that are literally revolutionary. Sure. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So, I, I mean, then you get to woman or man, and I've already mentioned just the legal restrictions that, that were on women. They really did not, not have rights. If you think about it, um, you know, try to think of a woman from antiquity 
uh, who really held a position of influence. You know, you, there are a few, very few, someone like Cleopatra. Uh, uh, and, and mostly we remember her as a sex symbol, really. I was going to say, it's not the one, the one I quite look up to, but you, but you said it first. Yeah, exactly. And it was, yeah. Everything she did was bedroom diplomacy. You know, do I put another notch in my lipstick case? You know, that's yeah. what it was all about, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so you don't have a lot of figures from antiquity who are women writers, for example, or women teachers. You know, you can think of Sappho, but not many others, can you? Uh, on the other hand, you can think of many men who wrote epic poems and so on, and, and were teachers in antiquity, philosophers and so on. Christianity came along and changed everything, and suddenly you have female figures appearing on the scene as teachers. Um, you know, you could start with the Virgin Mary, which is astonishing that someone, that, that a woman could occupy such a, a gigantic position in a religion in that world. It was something that was shocking to the pagans. And if you look at the first full-length uh, apologetic written against Christianity, an, apolo uh, an apology for paganism, it took that, that very fact the fact of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and, and, and blew it up and said, and said, look at this. They even have women that they have in these positions. And not only women, but they're not even aristocratic women. They're seamstresses. You know, this is a right. woman who worked with her hands. How shameful. This right. is degrading. This wow. is for the lower classes, maybe, but even for them, it's degrading. And then, in, right. you know, Right. But the Blessed Virgin Mary kind of sets the, sets the tone for the whole thing, because after her came the great figures like Thecla, who accompanied Paul and became one of the most venerated figures of the second century. Um, uh, then you have Perpetua, who, you know, occupies the same position in the third century. And what's, what's remarkable about her is that she left us her diary, and her diary became a bestseller soon after her death. You know, it was, it was copied out and circulated all around the world while all of the eyewitnesses to her martyrdom were still alive. Uh, so you couldn't lie. You couldn't fake it. Right. But, but what, we, what do we see with Perpetua? We see a woman who's in jail, right? She's in jail with a bunch of men, companions, and one, one woman, right? Mm -hmm. And she emerges as the charismatic leader in the group. She is the teacher. She is yeah. the writer. She is the one who prays, and she's the visionary. Oh, so like Perpetua it. occupies this position, yeah. and it's not like she's an outlier. Right. Within a generation, she's a, the, the saint who's venerated by the church Catholic, the universal church. Oh, right. you, got, you got me so excited. I know. I, 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 get a word. I, 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 and was she, was she doing that while in prison as well? Yes. Yeah. See that 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 to me, I mean, gosh, talk about the expression of the feminine genius, right? Which is like the thing we meditate on all the time and endow is that I mean, that's it, right? That's and, it. And there and we have her to look at, but she didn't have she had, you know, she had the Virgin Mary and she had the other women there, but we have this like wealth of women to look at and to be inspired by. And yet we still have confidence issues about it. But anyway. <laughs> So just a thought, not a homily. Keep going. I'm very. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the case of Perpetua, it, it's quite likely that her um, that her parish priest was in the prison cell with her. Okay, right. Satyrus, one of the figures she mentions in her diary, quite possibly was the parish priest who gave himself up then and presented himself to the wow. authorities so he could be with his people, but he ends up sitting at her feet. And learning from her. Yes. Oh, and, wow. And there are so many figures like this. You know, my my favorite is Agnes of Rome, um, and some historians believe that she is the single figure most responsible for the turning of the tide of public opinion in favor of Christianity. Oh, she's, she was the twitch upon the thread. She was that that. Yeah. Oh, that that's in, that's incredible. Because and when she does stand out, you know, she. Yeah. She does stand out. Uh, she she does have an incredible story. So I, I can see why that would, why she might be that figure. But you know, goodness, my mind's going a million different places. This must be so frustrating for you because you know all this with all the fine details. You know those letters we yeah we were gonna get to that we didn't even know existed. <laughs> notes, but um, 
but it must be so frustrating because, you know, my day-to-day -day encounter with, with women who are lapsed Catholics, you know, going to the doctor's appointments and just, you know, in daily life and, and the narrative being that there's no place for women in the church. And I'm thinking, this is, this is so infuriating because there's, I mean, there, this is the place, this is the supreme place for women in the world, right, is the, is the Catholic church. So goodness, the more you know. Keep and, going. And, and history, <laughs> history tells us, I think, that that um that women have always run the church yeah yeah if you look at every point in christian history there have been women there who were the driving force you know and just to to mention a few that are you know widespread uh, uh catherine of siena who yeah. was the the one person who was able to to bring the papacy back to its proper place in rome when all the 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 powerful men of her day failed they failed at it right. even the great saints failed right. at it she, yeah she succeeded um if you think of people like therese of lisieux you cannot name a spiritual figure in the last 400 years who has had more of a seismic effect on the spirituality of ordinary christians she is a phenomenon and she all she left us one little book one little book one little book dead at 24 was a cloistered nun and so <laughs> I mean, and my family's from the Middle East, and I mean, you think, what is, I mean, yes, the French colonized Egypt, so yes, they have the influence, but, but they adore her in yeah. the Middle East. St. Therese is everywhere, and you just, yeah. you just think, oh my gosh, dude, this is the power of holiness. I yes. mean, really, she's so popular still, sure. and died so young, and yeah. I'm in a cloister. <laughs> she's but she's the patroness of missionaries. I mean, it's it's just unbelievable. Like the faith and, is stunning. Yeah, and in my life, in my lifetime, you know, I, I think of the figure of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, whose face came uh, to define charity, to 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 be the icon of charity for an yeah. entire generation. Everybody knew her. Everybody loved her, and yeah. and she she opened her mouth and and she was like an oracle. We were all yeah. hanging on her words, you know, yeah. when I was when I was very young, and then even in well into my adulthood. Um, if you look at uh, those Christian bodies, separated Christian bodies, who have had um, female clergy, so to speak, for for a hundred years or more, they have not produced women of such influence. Yes, right. The Catholic faith right. has this tradition of powerful, influential women. We have a history yeah. of it. And, right. and if you look at it from the earliest times to today, it's always been the case. I believe um, that, that women are the engine of the church. They're the ones that make it run. And I believe this because I grew up in my mother's home and yes. I saw this firsthand that yes. she was, she was, she was the engine of the local church. She was the heart and soul of the parish. She made things happen. Yeah. And, uh, and there were a yeah. lot of other women like her. So yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was just talking to a priest friend who, um, we were talking about the liturgy and about, you know, just the, this outpouring of holiness simply because, you know, in the early, like Mary was at mass with, with the with the apostles and with with the early church and just her very presence and i think that's the other part of the femininity it's it's not just like they're the ones driving things which is true but also just the very presence the feminine presence and witness is so so powerful but the but the secular world wants to just keep having these boring conversations you know these reductionistic boring conversations but you look at the lives of the saints and this is like interesting and they were fed by mother church right yeah. all all these oppressive church teachings and laws has somehow produced these incredible incredible powerful women not just in the church but in the world yes. so anyway so it, it reduces power to political power and political power really doesn't add up to much as as we can see as we, you know? Know. Yes. <laughs> as we painfully have seen um so circling back to the early church so then just to pick up from that story so so you see these women um, who, so, so St. Paul has, has uttered these radical revolutionary words about the equality and about women's dignity. And then, and then what happens? Then what happens? Well, then what happens is that it, it's unleashed, really, because you have um, 
you have so many women emerging from the beginning. I already mentioned Thecla and Perpetua and, and Agnes. You know, you get a little bit later and you run, into, you run into a lot of others. But another phenomenon you see from the beginning is that, um, is that there are many women. Okay, uh, many women. That 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 adjective is used by even the earliest of the fathers. There are many women who consecrate their lives to Jesus. Okay, yeah. they consecrate their virginity to Jesus or their widowhood to Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's interesting what happens then, uh, because they're in a, an empire. Remember where there's a this this terrible shortage of women, and here they are appearing to be very unpatriotic because they're not willing to, um, to donate themselves to the emperor's cause, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. Up until that time, a woman's identity was determined by the men in her life. Who's your daddy, right? That's number one. Yeah. Who's your husband? That's number two. Number three, where are your sons? Show me the sons. Yeah. There's your worth. Yeah. The males in your life. Yeah. And here are these women who are saying, I got my worth, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't need any guy in my life. Yeah. I'm consecrated and yeah. my life is given to the church. They devote their lives and they, they develop a kind of a cult following yeah. um, and, and, um, and a veneration around them. And many women are doing this. Um, so there, there's something remarkable happening at that point. It's remar it is remarkable. But also at the same time, women are, are converting and, and the men are following them into conversions. And then these happy Christian families are emerging. And that's something starkly different from Augustus's campaign of like mm -hmm. trying to, you know, reward state sponsored marriage and family and it's not working but here with the advent of christianity we see that it's it's ha it's happening it's just happening among christians not pagans yeah, absolutely so, yeah. and, and that is a remarkable thing uh that that we can we can watch many women converted uh if you read the the works of the fathers of the church they often complain about that that so many women convert where are the men right um but i think it's because Christianity was attractive to women because it recognized their dignity. Yeah. It gave them a certain dignity within the, their community. Yeah. So that was attractive. Um, if you were a Christian, um, you were... Greco, the Greco-Roman world really uh, tended to marry off girls, and really girls, um, yeah. at age 11 or 12. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the marriage was consummated. Okay, and these girls were usually married to a man much older, like 30 years old. Yeah. So there wasn't a great relationship from the beginning. Abortion was very common. Yeah. Contraception was very common. Um, the sexual relationship between men and women was, was just not good. And if you want to know more detail, go and read the ancient Roman playwrights. Okay, because they considered that um, the very stuff of their comedy. Yeah. It's not funny. You yeah. know, it's, it's degrading. Yeah. So you have these things happen that um, uh, this, this becomes a trope in the lives of the martyrs. It, you know, the earliest instance of it, I know, is in Justin Martyr's second apology, his apology to the Senate, where he describes the life of this one woman. Presumably, everybody would know this story, who we're talking about here, but he doesn't mention her name. But she lived in your typical pagan marriage. And she just didn't find it very fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and Christianity arrived in her life, probably through the witness of a friend, mm -hmm. one of her women friends. Mm -hmm. And she, she saw this possibility and she converted. And she tried to convert her husband and he was having none of it. So he ends up denouncing her and she dies as a martyr. She dies happy. But it's an injustice there. You got to think about the attraction of it for her. This, yeah. this dignity that she, she saw and she wanted for herself and she wanted for her husband. She really yeah. wanted it for him too. Yeah, uh, which is really beautiful because in a way, there's every reason. I mean, it seems to me that there was authentic conversion there because she, she instead of using the faith to hate her husband who, who treated her in such an undignified manner, she also wanted him to meet Christ and wanted yeah. to bring him into that. And that that's beautiful. It didn't sort of end well, but it's very beautiful. Um, 
So, so then, okay. So then, gosh, where are we? Um, and then the, the empire converse. <laughs> I mean, just, voila. <laughs> Mentally, that's what happened. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, there was that great book by Rodney Stark. It came out in 1997, yeah. The Rise of Christianity. And yeah. it describes yeah. church growth through those first 300 years. Yeah. Because think about it. Christianity was illegal. And the practice of the faith was a capital crime. You could die for this. And especially during the reign of Decius in the middle of the third century and Diocletian at the beginning of the fourth. Ooh, no good. No good. Many people died. Many people died for it. So yeah. Christians are getting mowed down and they're dying from all the same plagues that afflicted the rest of the population and the earthquakes and the floods and everything else. Yep. But Stark demonstrates in his book that through those first three centuries when the faith was illegal, the church grew at a steady rate of 40% per decade. Yeah. 40% per decade. Yeah. I mean, your parish is growing that fast. Martyrdoms, martyrdoms happening, you know, plagues, bad sanitation, you know, hyg hygiene issues. I mean, the whole thing, you yeah. know. And, and yet, that's a stunning, the blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the church. I mean, it really comes true. It really So here's, here's what's happening. The women are attracted because of this greater dignity. Yeah. The men are attracted because all the women... Yeah. are in church you know there are no pagan women all, all the women went to youth group so all the guys went <laughs> and the same old story but anyway <laughs> so. evidence seems to indicate that many of the male converts to christianity were converted by their wives yeah. this is a beautiful thing yeah because this is kind of the way it works you know I was gonna um, say, this is kind of the way it works women just we're just more spiritual i mean more spiritually minded i mean there are more female mystics I think for that reason, right? I mean, you can yeah. me if I'm being too proud over here, but I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, I think you're right. And I think, I think in the dynamic of, of conversion too, you'll often hear men say, I pursued her, I pursued her until she caught me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, so funny. I've never heard that. That is, I like that. That's, but I think that's what happened yeah. in antiquity. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, they pursued, uh, you know, these women until the yeah. women caught them and caught them for the church. And you think about it, a loving relationship in normal circumstances will be a more fruitful relationship. Yeah. When, when, when guys and gals like each other, they're more likely to get together and have babies, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the Roman emperors are kind of putting dollars on the table, trying to get men and women to make love. Can't buy it, me love, can't buy me love, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't it didn't work. work. And you know what else is stunning that didn't work is the Christian families taking care of pagans' families or pagans who'd abandoned their own families and ran off with the plague, you know, when the plagues were hitting and all of that. And, and, and even, I can't remember, I'm sure you remember the emperor's name who was like, even the Nazarenes are taking care of our own. I think it was just, just any. Julian the Apostate. Julian the Apostate, that guy, see? <laughs> If, any, if anyone was going to know off the top of their head, it was going to be you. Um, but yeah, I mean, that you and, and you couldn't, you know, he, I think he also said, hey, uh, let's start, let's start acting. Let's start, let's start doing charitable works. We're starting to look bad. But again, you, that comes from conversion from the heart because of our Lord. It, it does, you can't legislate that. It just doesn't work. And it doesn't have the same fruitfulness. You know? And actually, we have an experimental version of that that we can see and we can see how it failed uh, at the time of the severan emperors at the end of the 100s and the beginning of the 200s the roman emperors tried a different strategy they could see that christians were reproducing themselves and romans weren't right yeah. the pagans weren't right. so they said well let's try to do what the christians do and they enacted laws forbidding abortion and this is the first time this, is, wow. this had happened in history. Wow. Only the Jews. The Jews were the only ones in all of history who had ever had laws forbidding abortion and infanticide. Yeah. Well, now the Severan emperors, pagans, were trying to imitate the Christians by enacting laws against abortion. Um, and they failed. Again, you could bribe people. You can yeah. make laws, but you can't change the heart. You yeah. can't make people love one another. Yep. You know, but they, when, 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 when Christians worshiped the Trinitarian God, who is love, they brought that eternal love down to earth and it radiated out from their homes and converted their neighborhood. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's the only way to do it. You yeah. can't do it top down. That's you the way it's happened then. That's the way it's going to happen now. <laughs> so I believe that. I really believe that too. I really believe that too. That that's stunning. Well, goodness, I I lost track of time, which I really <laughs> do during interviews. But here we are. Um, anything else you would like to say before? And I'm going to link uh, to our podcast and YouTube channel, FathersOfTheChurch.com. That's oh, your thank you. yeah. We'll link to that. We'll link to the book that I mentioned in the beginning. Yours is the church. Um, totally worth the read. Um, and uh, I love Rodney Stark, so we'll, we'll link that book. But any other, anything else? And I hope you come back on the show. I hope you come Anytime. back. Anytime. Yes, I would love, because, yeah, you know, just be great. Um, and only one other book, and that is my, my book, The Witness of Early Christian Women, uh, Mothers of the Church. But, yeah, that's what it's called. I think I can pull it down. And yeah, I can show, you. show it. Yeah. That's Witness of Early Christian Women, Mothers of the Church. Is that a new one-ish? New-ish? No? Nope. Nope, it's pretty old. Oh, well, I must have missed it. I must have missed it, but I- If you I, want the Portuguese edition, here it is. <laughs> how cool is that? Yeah, that's fantastic. All, all of these awesome books are being translated in different languages and getting out there because I think really history is so, is so important. First, for me, what, what, what studying history has done is, has given me consolation, really, and confidence to- And hope. And- and, and to be really, to know how to frame, you know, um, the value of Christianity, not just in my own salvation, my own relationship, but the, how, how crucial it is for the entire world. Anytime we have any debates in the public square about uh, male-female dynamic and feminism and all, this, all these things, I mean, we're, we're the only reason there, there's a possibility of that even being on the table is because of our Lord. So, you know, I just want to give credit where credit's due and try to avoid spiritual pride. As much Absolutely. As <laughs> so, anyway, well, thank you so much, Mike. It was so, so good to talk to you, and hope, until, until next time.